Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Saito Town Hall number, I believe, six. Um, I seem to be getting some feedback there, so I'm going to just uh, make sure my mic isn't feeding back. Um, yes, hello. Welcome, everyone. Uh, tonight, we've got uh, David and myself with you again. It's been a bit of a break in between, but really glad to be back on a town hall. Uh, catch up with all of you. I'm still I'm getting it. Yeah, I'm getting the same. Let me see if I can swap out my my mic. Hold on a second. Do you have it open in another tab, maybe? No, I don't believe so. Maybe I did. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry, uh, <laughs> no. Yeah. Right. Okay. The technical issues is sorted. Uh, yeah. Format for tonight will be uh, the tried and true. I'll run through some basic updates around different aspects of the project uh, and then hand over to David for a more specific uh, technical catch up. Uh, and then we'll throw open the um, forum or the floor to questions from, from the room. Um, I think, uh, you know, we've seen a steady improvement and, and just, uh, you know, quality in those questions uh, every town hall. So looking forward to that. Um, Kicking off, I think the, uh, yeah, as people know, the biggest as asset we have as a project really is our community. Um, and it's been a hallmark of the last probably six weeks since we last caught up, uh, just how involved the community is becoming. I think we've got six non-English groups that have formed by themselves and who are doing things like translating material, uh, you know, forming communities, et cetera. Um, we had that fantastic session. I think it was a highlight uh, of the last month or so for me and for David, I know um, with Zero X Luminous um, recently, um, you know, some, just some really quality um, questions and thinking about the project and where we're at. And we really appreciated that. Um, and we're starting to get more and more people helping out in serious, significant ways with things like websites and, you know, product design and that sort of thing. Um, and that's going to be one of the things where it is already one of the things we're working on uh, heavily at the moment is improving uh, our offerings to community in terms of just the simple things about how to find out what's going on, how to get involved in something, um, you know, find a good place where skills that people you know, are offering to bring to the project, et cetera, can be, can be used uh, and you know, make that a little bit more rewarding and, and um, fun for people as well. So that's something that's starting to take traction. Again, that that's something we're doing in in um, collaboration with some senior community members. Um, so that that's really cool. Um, and at the same time, I think uh, due to some work from us, but also um, you know just the kind of project maturing, we've had more and more support. I think from our from our supporter base, um, you know, the people who've come in and uh, invested in Saito, uh, specifically you know, with some articles and things going out from major funds. Uh, I think you've seen the number of AMAs and that kind of outreach outreach we've been doing. Um, and also we've been getting more and more opportunities to speak on some reasonably significant YouTube channels, you know, uh, Cryptocida, Hashashi, I forget the one David did, but I think that, that was quite good as well, I forget the name of it. Um, so we're kind of really pleased that the the way the kind of marketing and outreach is, is becoming more and more organic um, and more and more relevant and I think high quality and sort of, you know, supporting what we're doing much, much more. We're spending a lot less time in kind of DeFi groups trying to explain what we're doing to people who aren't as connected and more and more time speaking about fundamentals to people who are really interested in, in kind of how we're doing, what we're doing, why we're doing it, etc. cetera. Um, on the partnership front, there are a few new partnerships brewing. Um, again, some of them initiated by supporters who are connecting us up with other projects that want to collaborate with us. Uh, and we'll have some news, I think, on those shortly. Um, and we're also putting some meat on the bones of other partnerships we've, we've got going. We've got some really um, cool stuff happening. David, David's been working on it recently um, with our partner, Mishin, and that that's around the uh, crypto integration stuff and that's really starting to come together looking promising uh, and that's it's great to be able to have those sort of um, longer term partnerships start to bear some fruit there um, other project news in terms of listings um, I think everybody here knows our stance on listings uh, you know that we're not just going to splash around tokens to big exchanges just because you know they are who they are 
um, we've got some fairly strong criteria about how listings will support the project and support community. And the good news on that front is that we're making good ground. You know, we're getting much more traction with, with major exchanges around what we expect out of those sorts of deals. And we're getting closer and closer to, to pinning one down. And I think that's something that, you know, people uh, obviously, you know, um, see the value in and it's something we've been working on as a kind of slow boil for some time and i hope we have some some good news again there in the, in the very near future um big part of what's taking up i think both david and my time is hiring um and that's a place where i think people have seen the call out to community and we appreciate some of the support we've got there um we're really i think we've learned a little bit over the course of kind of you know running the project um, about the value of having people who really understand what we're wanting to do and who kind of buy into the vision. Um, and we've also got more and more opportunities to try and connect with that kind of uh, candidate because the community is growing and so forth. So we're trying to not just get community help on hiring, but, but hire from community where possible. Uh, and that's a great position to be in. Um, but obviously hiring is a very, you know, especially building out the, 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 backbone of a team, you need to be quite thoughtful uh, about getting the right people in and making sure it's all working. So um, good progress there. But again, you know, slow and steady. Um, quick note on the PancakeSwap liquidity program. Uh, the big note thing there is we continue to monitor as we always committed to doing. But that's been 100% community backed now for well over a month. Uh, and that's fantastic just that, that that program we put in place is actually being used uh, and delivering rewards to, to people who are participating. Um, another great thing that's happened in, I think, just in the last week and a half or so is we got you know nothing and then a, a downpour. Uh, the patents that we originally got in the US on the, some of the core aspects of site of consensus um, have been ratified for Europe and China. And that's, I think, really fantastic news for the project in a couple of ways. It's obviously extended protection for what we're doing and stops corporates or other people trying to muscle in uh, on an open network. Uh, and it also just provides some recognition for the novelty uh, and you know uniqueness of what we're doing. And so it's, it's always nice to have that formalized, um, you know, even though the patent system is what it is, um, it's just good to have that for, you know, be able to get that formally recognized. It also helps us present the project into other spaces, you know, beyond community and, and the Web3 and crypto space um, and get taken seriously when when sometimes that's that's a yeah. little difficult. Um, it's also prior art for Web3 mm. generally, which is one thing I think a lot of people yeah. miss, right? Like, because the data happens to 2017. Yeah. So, you know, if push comes to shove, you know, on-chain email, all of the on-chain apps we're doing, the precedent legally now is 2017 yeah. summer. And that, that's really strong, I think, as well. People, yeah, people are missing how much weight that gives the project. Um, and the last small point, but a cool one, actually, uh, that I wanted to raise up before I hand over to David is that we, I think in the last week and a half, clicked over 20 million transactions on uh, Cyto Networks since we started. Uh, What's obvious about that is the, obviously the second 10 million came a lot faster than the first and at the current rate, you know, the, the next 10 million will be even quicker and, and so on. And that's really core to a lot of, if people are familiar with the roadmap, that's, that's core to a lot of the things we need to be achieving is building on-chain transactions and usage, um, not just to demonstrate um, consensus and the, you know, the, the quality of what we're building, but also to, you know, become the backbone of the, the basis of a real on-chain economy. Um, so that's that's it from me. And I'll hand over now for an update from David on, on some of the tech aspects that he's been stewarding. Um, OK, uh, I'm going to keep things short because we've got the long roadmap. Uh, so I'll just tell you briefly what's happening. Um, starting with Rust, uh, we got it done. I'm not happy with the way the network stuff was coded. Um, there were some parts of the architectural design that were built for a network like Bitcoin, where peers just kind of randomly do stuff. Uh, and there's things we want to do with Rust that the architecture wasn't great for. Things like Wasm, so the JavaScript is using the same code as Rust. So we kicked Rust back into a refactor that's underway. Uh, that's ongoing. Um, as I said, we've now got, I think, two people staffed on it, and we're hiring number three. 
Um, <clears throat> in terms of the website, we've got a new website. Uh, that should be coming out, I think, in about two weeks. All of this stuff is in the roadmap, so I'll keep it quick. Um, the Web3 generic crypto stuff, uh, that's we're doing that through this partnership with MeSyn uh, as a simple and easy way to get it going. Um, that should be ready technically in about a week and a half, I think. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to get the new website up and we're going to look at it and we're going to be figuring out how we can re redesign the experience of the arcade so that when people come into the arcade, the existence of Web3 cryptos and like Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever we bring on one by one just works. Uh, so we're going to be looking at doing uh, basically a top-down redesign of the arcade at this point. Uh, and I'm not sure, we're probably going to bring things out in stages, but in terms of the arcade, that stuff's happening. <coughs> you guys will notice if you've been checking, there's just been a, a non-stop series of upgrades and improvements to the games too. Uh, a lot of credit goes to Dan, um, who's been working on that stuff non-stop. If you know what game's not listed that everyone keeps asking for, we're pretty close to that being done too. So mm -hmm. all it's of this a, stuff... A, it's actually done about 15% of our transactions in the last few days for testing. So. Really? Yeah. It's uh, popular. Yes. The, the generic island trading game. Mm. Uh, not to be confused with anything else, please. Mm. Um, so that stuff's happening. Uh, I, uh, there's another game I'm working on. We'll see if anything happens with it, but that's kind of a weekend thing for me. Um, so that's the website. That's uh, JavaScript, uh, generic Web3 crypto, um, rust and stuff. So, you know, and we're hiring the team, we're growing, we need more people on JS. Our goal is to have probably three people tasked uh, full time on rust and backend stuff and three people tasked full time on the JavaScript stuff. Um, there, I saw a question on like team size and stuff. So that's where we are. That's where we're going. Um, if there are any specific questions, uh, otherwise, you yeah. know, uh, check in with a roadmap and we can check in and uh, answer any specifics. Cool. You want to move on to questions? I think it's us yeah. yelling, lecturing people. <laughs> on. Um, yeah, I just I just uh, use that as an opportunity to, to to roll through the questions. I think basically taking um, taking them from the top make, makes sense. Um, first one there is on AdForce, uh, and Nick just wanting to know a bit more about the kind of concept, how it'll work, and and what the kind of optimal time to switch it on will be you you want me to take this yeah you, you give it a shot and i'll fill anything in that, that okay so we've got like a community rewards section in tokenomics which is a billion tokens if we want we can get more tokens in from elsewhere um the challenge is we don't want to be flooding the market obviously with tokens and we want to figure out how things work <clears throat> how does the ad faucet work um when people show up uh, to let's say the SATO Arcade or SATO Email or whatever other app you've got, they install a module. So this module is like the Arcade. One nice thing about SATO is all of the applications are running at the same time. So if you're playing a game, the Arcade is still running. If you're playing two games and you're viewing one, the second one is still running. So you've got an application that's now running in your browser that's showing you advertisements and that will periodically send you fractions of a SATO. Are you making too many transactions? You've run out of Sato. I'll show you another ad. I'm going to send you some more Sato. So the idea is that the people who are using the network are slowly trickled out the Sato. We don't want to send huge amounts. The goal is just to get enough that they can make transactions on the network and we can eventually shift to the default use of the network is paying these fees because the fees are collected by the nodes that are running the actual infrastructure what this really is is a way of getting money from us to the people who are developing the software and developing the infrastructure that's supporting the network the thing we have to be careful of when we build it is that we don't build something that just becomes uh like you know like a proof of work like people are mining transactions by spamming the network so <clears throat> that's kind of what we have to that's the that's the big thing. So we're going to need to develop the ad faucet, you know, with captchas or whatever, so that we don't just have one guy running five hundred thousand accounts, spamming the network with transactions and 
somehow figuring out how to pocket that cash themselves. Um, but that's the general structure. And so this is why uh, on the roadmap, if you notice, we talk about how I think it's like second era is where we think it makes sense to be developing it. Mm -hmm. And by the third area, we expect to have this figured out and be able to kind of pump it up. But the idea mm -hmm. is that <clears throat> if we get the ad faucet working, we can have a long period like Bitcoin where we can bleed tokens into the network, but the activities on the network are driving growth because yeah. people aren't using the arcade because they're trying to play to earn Sado. They're using the arcade because they want to be using the cryptographic applications. What we're doing is we're just leaking out the tokens so that it is effectively free to people for 20 years. And then the idea yeah. is that after 20 years, we've got a lot of transaction volume. If people need to switch, you know, maybe the advertising faucet's enough, maybe it's not, but um, we can switch because at that point, like, well, we'll, you know, after 20 years, we'll have gotten rid of the extra billion tokens or whatever, and hopefully things can continue from there. Yeah, I think it's, I see it a little bit like surfing, right? You've got to kind of swim into the wave, which mm. if, you, if you go too fast, you just, you miss the wave. But if you get it right, it propels you forward, right? So we need to, if we're just dumping tokens into the space it hurts mm. everybody and there's no you know we diminish all the value yeah. um if you do it just right then that's adding value to node operators that they wouldn't otherwise have because it's bringing people in who would be price sensitive initially yeah um, and a as that kicks into a virtuous circle then things become um yeah margins tighten up uh, people get better at running their nodes and their hardware there's more software available uh to different people and the ecosystem can start to grow organically with this kind of um just accept you know with this this the faucet kind of just accelerating that process yeah. um and so it's it's a known it's a known technique it's just getting it right in this in this case and and it's an unknown space so we need to be kind of thoughtful maybe two more small points for those who really like digging into this yeah. first is selling ads um one it can be an independent business model on its own the ideal thing is we get enough money coming in from advertising that it pays for the cost of mining and staking because at that point we've got an economic system where the token just increases in value um mm -hmm. so partly it's about growing the economic independence and creating the circular economy the second thing is uh, we're planning token persistence by guaranteeing large amounts and then slowly reducing it. So one other benefit of this is it allows us to experiment with the ad faucet at slow volume and small scale because we can set up, we can test the ad faucet, we can keep working at scale. Um, and then it's only the people that really collect a lot of money at the very beginning who will turn that into real Sado or persistent Sado, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> So we can debug it and develop it on the live network. And then as it gets good and as growth continues and we expand, uh, it's something that, you know, we can kind of iterate on development without crippling the community and crippling our ability to figure it out. Yeah. Richard? Cool. Yeah, no, I think that that's good. Uh, maybe I'll just move on and take the, because I kind of covered it, the next question quickly. Um, uh, well, actually, you covered it in terms of rough numbers. We're concentrating on dev first. As we get dev buttoned up, there'll be some other roles we need to like glue things together, perhaps more capability and product and product design, that sort of thing. Um, I, I have a real feeling it's going to be one of those never rains it pause or, you know, slowly, slowly, then suddenly kind of situations where we're you know, talking to three or four, five new candidates in most in, in each area per day um and you know we're putting them into a pipeline and so everything's coming in the front um my guess is that we'll suddenly be start start making one or two or three offers a day in the near future and hopefully some of those come through so we're looking at expanding by four to five people i think in the next month hopefully um but you know we're not going to go and, and and hand out job offers to people who aren't right for the project um just to meet that goal so it's a you know, it's a balance on that. Did you have anything else to add, David, on on, on hiring members? No, that's good. We've got a lot of questions. Let's uh, let's yep. punch through. You want Oops, me to take token uh, permits? Uh, yep. Okay. So the idea is we're going to guarantee uh, starting with large amounts, and we may start by guaranteeing what's in the staking table. 
So if you move a bunch of large tokens in the staking table, we'll guarantee that they're going to stick around. We're just going to lower that over time. Um, the technical things that we need to deal with, uh, one, resetting the network, <coughs> uh, just making sure that they're there, et cetera. We also need to be optimizing the algorithms for how much, how many people have stuff in the staking table uh, and then testing how that affects the performance of reorgs. So it's something that's designed, you know, it also, I guess, has the advantage of it encourages people to get tokens out of the ERC and BEP markets and get them onto the actual staking mechanism where there will be some profit. But um, yeah, you know, how fast it is, well, we'll see. Yep. Uh, you know, it depends how the core stuff goes, that depends <laughs> how Iron goes, but that's the plan. We'll start high and we're going to lower it over time. Yeah, I think also the thing to keep in mind is, you know, the the interrelationship between everything in the in the different eras in the roadmap and the, the token permanence isn't simply about like technical guarantees on the code, etc. It's also about having transaction flow and fee supply mm -hmm. Uh, in place in a way with fee flow in a way uh, in place in a way that actually lets consensus secure the network we, you know token yeah. permanence isn't, isn't just about does the software work it's also you know how much money would you need to e even if you're not going to be able to cause you know fatal problems how much money would you need to have to cause really <sighs> annoying problems and initially you know until we get enough uh, traffic that that number is possibly too low just for us to be confident and happy to say we're, we're offering that so it's it's a mixture of things and we need to coordinate them all uh, as we go along it's coming it's going to start with big holders uh who want to put a bunch of tokens in the staking table and we'll go from there yeah cool it's not um, go back, so you know yeah uh should i take i'll take the next one and then maybe you take uh, fedex sure. uh atr question uh, I mean, of course, we're always looking at any other any new partnerships that are going to push us forward that are going to help the project. Um, I think one of the best things we've seen is things like the Elrond partnership and how that connected us to their community, uh, and you know how that really helped drive the project forward. Uh, so we're obviously continuing to look for new opportunities like that. You know, we're not very interested in light and fluffy, brand name only kind of collaborations, uh, but. And, as part of that as well, I think you'll see like, you know, we did a lot of work with with the, you know, stuff we did with Polkadot, we were, you know, contributed a lot, we, we open source some software with them. Um, the, you know, commitment we have to those partnerships is real. And so what we're also spending as much time on is actually getting some real value for both sides out of them. And the Mesium work we've been doing recently is like a, a good example of that. So anyone who's aware of any partnerships and stuff, hit us up info at Cyto.tech will definitely look. Um, but we're also a little bit judicious about making sure the partnership fits the project and is something we can commit to and be be a useful part of. Yeah, I also think people will see us delivering on the stuff that we've already agreed to because that yeah. it's coming out, you know. Yeah. Um, I'll take the ATR question. Uh, the yep. answer I give, <coughs> the question here is what keeps you from paying rent too often? Uh, the answer I give is as long as rent is at market price for storage on the blockchain in that period of competition it doesn't really matter if you pay it one day at a time or if you pay it one year at a time because a year of rent is the equivalent of 365 days of rent so that's the answer i give um there's minor like the minor technical concern really is we charge people the smoothed a multiple of the smoothed rent and so it's how you'd figure that out if the chain is too short but um yeah, I mean, if you're paying a market price, the without ATR, you pay once, and that's supposed to pay for forever. With ATR, you pay the market rate per second, per day, per year, whatever it is. Hmm. Uh, and like, if it's the market rate, uh, it doesn't really matter the frequency; it matters hmm. the prices. I think, I think, and, and then in reality as well, I think you know the the we're not going to have you know random uh, and highly variant uh chain links with with Sido as implemented i mean uh, if you're in that situation increase the genesis period so that people have the opportunity to spend their utxo yeah. before they rebroadcast yeah right like well, that's a sign your genesis period is way too short because you're right. being used as a store of value primarily 
And like if that's Bitcoin, we'll have a 20 year genesis period because you're rebroadcasting everything all the time. Well, don't do that. Yeah. And I think that 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 ties into what I was going to actually kind of come in on as well is like the thing is, it's a market and you can sophisticated people, you can set and forget and just put enough money in it you take so to make sure it goes around a few times but anyone sophisticated and service providers will come along that can do this for you might look at optimal rebroadcasting times hmm. for manual rebroadcasting given knowledge of the market like you know like aws initially with netflix had the ability to offer cheap compute when nobody else needed it hmm. um so there's nothing wrong with running a bank or financial type service as a service on site or to like help people analyze when should you optimally do this if you've got a set of subset of data that you want to keep on chain so mm -hmm. if people are using features of the on-chain liveness of data and there's that's a cost to them they're not stuck with atr as the only mm -hmm. way of keeping that on chain they they can manage that very actively if that's in their interest uh, and yeah. i think that's something that's it's not always clear it's super clear to david and i maybe we forget about that because pre-atr we were looking and thinking well should we just put in like a, a bank module or a bank facility to demonstrate that this is safe um and so we've always been aware of the ability to like have a programmable and automated management system on top of atr if yeah. that's useful to you um atr really is in op is in response to concern about you know important things falling off the chain without you know support so i i just say that's a great question but it's a question for blockchains where dev set rent if the market mm -hmm. price is setting the rent it just doesn't matter you're paying the market rate uh, i mean there's probably some point where like if rent is less than one nolan then you've got a problem but uh otherwise market rate whatever it is like you'll pay a tiny amount rebroadcasting and it's it's also it's better to pay a tiny fee each time around than to pay a really heavy fee up front yeah cool um i think we should probably also then give some time on on recursions question here about what the app stack looks like mm -hmm. um and i think the first thing i'd say about that is where did it disappear to the question anyway we've got um okay it's it's, it's slid down uh I'm going to upload it so it goes back to the top. Um, he's asked uh, what the app stack look like, would look like. You know, um, does the, does the source code live on chain, etc.? Um, I think there's a bunch of different things here for me and David to get into. Uh, one of the key things to know is that this it's not set. Like the the chain is a resource. Uh, and there are very different ways of of interacting with that and, and building on it. Um, but what we can do probably is give you an indication of different ways that we see things working. Um, and then there's some key points, like you ask about things like decentralizing domains and DNS resolution. And there are some very fundamental parts of how Slido is built that actually tie into that. Um, so um, in terms of you know, the source code living on chain, that is possible but my sense is by and large it won't um people will publish store. sign payloads the app store does it if you publish an mm -hmm. app you're publishing a transaction that contains your code on chain it's in mm -hmm. a transaction it's signed by your public key by sorry by your private key so anyone who gives that transaction to you the source code you can cryptographically verify who published it mm -hmm. it's like the app store in right. that sense stuff can live on chain yeah you so publish code on chain and sign it and everyone knows that you okayed this so we can have a decentralized app review and rating mechanism people mm -hmm. can pay me to look at source code and say this is safe because they don't yeah. want to install strangers stuff yeah. um so you can put stuff on chain and have things like the app store result so mm -hmm. my, my sense there was, I, I think I was thinking about it in terms of the ATR sense. I don't think people will necessarily keep it rotating around on the chain, but it will de definitely be published via the chain. And I think people will then make repositories because the important thing to remember is, so Davis, but once something is signed, the cryptographic proof doesn't go away with the blockchain. Yeah. The, the signature remains valid forever. Let, let's um, move on because I think his question is how it yeah. serves clients. And the yeah. important thing there is we don't care. Uh, with yeah. every blockchain, you are vulnerable at the point where you download the software. 
So if you're visiting Sado.io and you're downloading the JavaScript every time, you're vulnerable. <coughs> you're vulnerable to attack every time you visit our website. If someone else sets it up, you're vulnerable every time you visit their website. So that's why uh, transaction volume play with transient wallets is not a tr it's not a play with store of value in your browser. There's obviously though you don't need to download the JavaScript from us. We can compile it into Electron. You download it once. So Sado is a blockchain. Uh, how you get the software? That's there are many ways of doing it. The important thing is that, like what we're doing, we're doing for various reasons. So we don't want to go to people and say, in order to use Sado, you have to download the software because no one does that anymore. We want to start them in the browser easy, playing games. And then when they've got a wallet that they care about uh, and there's enough assets store of value there, we can say, look, maybe you should um, use a paper wallet or maybe you should use Electron. Yeah. Um, and I think moving, moving on from that, to me, the, there's, there's a sort of question here about uh, how things will integrate, et cetera. And, and to David's point, uh, we're also going to be agnostic uh about how people build apps right if people want to build a uh, an app in in pure haskell fantastic i'd love to see that happen what we are didactic about and, and pointed about is that we the applications should be nodes proper mm -hmm. nodes so they should have the ability to verify ch chain interactions and basically a good way to think about it is that the tra the side of transaction should be their unit of of, of commerce right they should be able to understand a side of transaction and validate it and have enough and be able to get sufficient block information to to know that that's in the chain if you slip away from that you slip into a space where somewhere you're introducing it some trusted third party and that, that's the whole point is that we're trying to avoid that mm. so there's nothing stopping people building models that go to look awfully like in Fura, but that that would be something we would be saying well why why would you yeah. want to do that that's that's anathema to what we're trying to achieve maybe one final comment i'll add on the dns stuff uh sado's a pki network so we don't need dns if we could do something like every major release of the software we sign it with our public our private key publish it to the network hmm. Everyone can independently confirm that it's from us. We don't need a middleman person. Like it's part of the point of rebuilding these internet services on a PKI stack. Like yeah. you don't need DNS because it's just built in. Well, I think one of the things there that we've we've also we see it's one of the classic side of narratives is uh, saying this to some some people in the community the other day who are helping on a project, uh, trying to explain, you know, something they were trying to to help us get some communication on. They were trying to do a diagram for us and. Um, there's this classic thing that happens in blockchain where like, oh, we decentralized and we solved A, B and C. So now we can do anything. So the classic you know, Ethereum thing, okay, we have a blockchain, you can run decentralized applications on it. So somehow magically that stays decentralized, even if you're going entirely through Infura and the app that you're running is a classic web two application that just hits an API. And that's, that's something that we're really keen on avoiding it's also why we don't use some techniques that do have other scaly kind of properties like going to a dag because you lose the ability to talk to everyone in the network without an intermediary right so the choice there's some very fundamental architectural choices in Saito that we mm -hmm. stick to because the solution to the autonomy and the sovereignty that something like bitcoin gives people on the network goes away if you remove universal broadcast. It's a very simple yeah. thing, how it works in Bitcoin. But going to systems that obfuscate that break it, on the other hand, if you leave it in there and you're true to it, then to at David's point, you don't need DNS when you can always fall back to um, always fall back to people's addresses. And you can send a message to any address without without any permission or without any need for a third party. I'll, I'll take the next one, private key security. Yeah. Uh, I think again, it's like the app stack, and your camera is unfocused, Richard. If you can't see, I it. know it's it's a very strange thing. I'm, I'm trying to work out what where we're up to with the. You, you handle private key security. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll handle private key while Richard fusses around. Um, <laughs> you know, if your private key is compromised, your entire the the UTXO are compromised. Um, a private key is a number, um, so it, it's not like something we're actively working on, but. All of that stuff's possible. 
you know, one interesting thing you can do maybe for new ideas of how to secure wallets is you can sign a transaction and encrypt it and then broadcast it in another transaction. So you can do things like transactions inside transactions. And there are probably some interesting ways to like safeguard security there that you can't do if you're using a blockchain that <coughs> like you can't just put data inside transactions. That might be interesting with multi-sig too. But yeah, uh, there's no reason we can't have cold wallets, hot wallets, whatever. No. You know, we're not starting with that. We're starting with transient wallets in the browser that will probably be attacked and shifting from there to downloadable electron-like applications as people want security. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, cool. Should we, I, I might tackle the, the question at the top then on ASICs and lottery nodes. Mm -hmm. I think uh, ASICs won't specifically be useful um maybe in the node so much as what what we will see is there are certain functions that will make a a, a, a um, routing node much more um capable and that would be the ability to sign transactions and add to their path very very quickly um, and that's actually something you could build in at the nick level so i think we'll see we'll see this kind of the same kind of innovation we saw with ASICs being applied. You know, we had some sort of CPU mining, GPU mining, and then ASIC mining on Bitcoin and on Gen POW generally. I think what you'll see in CIDO is ordinary network cards. Um, people then um, cannibalizing or refactoring custom network equipment like you know, heavy and Cisco routers that can be reprogrammed uh, in a kind of GPU, GPU type mode. And then eventually people will start designing NICs with CIDO uh, signing and routing path management built in at the NIC level, which will just mean that a NIC could get the network interface on a server could get an instruction like these are our, these are who we're sharing transactions within the network and then just go for it as fast as you can sign and, and propagate transactions. And I think we'll see considerable uh, innovation in that space as transaction flow becomes valuable to people. Um, I'll offer a more straightforward, just really direct question on ASICs. Uh, the problem with ASICs is the rich get richer in proof of work because mm -hmm. you're, you're spending less money for more hash power. But you've got like economies of scale and that stuff. Sato, we don't care about ASICs. Mining is not about difficulty. Mining is just about cost. And <clears throat> you got to burn this much money to do it. It doesn't really matter if you've got one person. If we have one miner producing solutions, it doesn't matter because the mining is operating at a loss. Um, like, so it, this is um, the, the real ASIC is the network, which is fee collection. And the question is, can you build a machine that gives you a competitive advantage in fee collection? Well, it's like, well, maybe you can, but like normally in economics, the services that are small and that are not in mass market are the ones that can command the most fees. So it would make sense that if you're commoditizing something, you're actually, getting the lowest price for it and you know the person that's producing that niche service is getting the highest fee so you know i kind of think that you know sato consensus is anti-asic in the in the sense that like you can't go to a market and say i've just developed a machine that is going to get all of the highest fees to me because you know as soon as that exists the market routes around it you've got to provide value cool um, should we just take the next one off the top? These are a lot of these are from recursion. I'm impressed, um, but they are getting upvoted, so I'm, I'm happy to keep going <laughs> with, with these questions. Um, did you did you want to kick in on this, or maybe I get started and you? Uh, we know people want to do social media. I think the challenge for us is like there are a lot of Web two people that are going out and competing with. We, we, we're building the stack as well as the applications. And I think the challenge for getting use is not just putting out a demo, but putting out something with enough polish and uh, ease of use that people really want to use it. Um, the ideas that people keep coming with where they say, we really need to do this are chat um, and social media like Twitter. So I think that's the stuff that we're going to be leading with uh, soon as, you know, if someone else comes up with an idea and wants to work on something, we're happy to help. We're kind of curious as well. And that's a question for the community. Like what apps will generate transaction volume? Hmm. Decentralized Telegram? If we can get people using it. 
Yeah, I think that's that to me. It's a really intriguing question because I think there's some stuff like um, there's some stuff like IoT, which I think will will come along like a wave at some point where people building IoT devices realize, oh, look, we don't need a data center anymore because the chain can be the trusted path for mm. information between devices and their owners. And in fact, it's a lot more secure um, and cheaper than running, you know, this sort of centralized infrastructure to do it. Um, there's things in terms of ecosystem maturity that you probably need before that happens. So in terms of first thing, I don't think so, but I can see a wave of IoT type traffic um, coming sometime in the future. So, um, uh, you want me to handle the uh, RPC pocket question? Yes. Did you just yep. delete that? You just did. I just it. say I answered it. Oops. I think uh, maybe no, I did. You the top one. Uh, so the question was if we're worried about applications like Pocket or whatever RPC hmm. access node providers, can they outcompete Infura? The answer is no, and the reason is simply that if you use them, you have to pay money. So the money is coming from you somehow. It's coming directly in the form of fees or it's coming from them monetizing your transaction, your existing fee. Sado, we don't have extra fees. So I don't know if that's a good enough reason for people to switch to Sado. It's probably not because like maybe you cut your fee in half. That's not a good reason to like abandon network effect. But long term, I mean, I, I think anyone who's looking at the consumer internet realizes that the winning business models are the ones where usage is free. Uh, you know, that's why it's the ad faucet and essentially free to use internet. You'll get a certain amount of tokens. You can use them for some amount of network usage. Um, yeah, and I don't think that if the choice is between Sado, which is free to use, and some Infura like extra fee craven third party service, like I'm not leaving Sado. So I think there's more of a flow to us than away from us. Richard? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the only other thing I'd say there is in terms of like the way Sado works that um, it's putting people in direct competition and the pricing, you know, the, the whole economics of it is based on that that competitive node rather than these sort of uh, layers that get put on where people are pricing arbitrarily um, mm. in, a, in an abstract competition and then hoping that they can monopolize slowly so that they don't have to pay as much attention to like out competing. Right, that's that's the model. That's Web two. That's how it works. So, one the only way to get away from that is to do what we do with Sido. And so, you no, know, it's going to be a it's going to be per force at the consensus level a marketplace for this. Um, Next one's really vague. Uh, what business models? I mean, we mentioned some. Like, mm -hmm. if there's a centralized app store, decentralized moderation. I could be a software reviewer, and I cryptographically sign and publish a message saying which applications. Are secure and which versions so you know you're not going to get hacked there's one yeah. uh, another one i love is the idea of having ad stores so instead of you know advertisers needing to try and target people and try and kind of gather mm. as much information clandestinely on users mm. people being able to say look i'm interested in buying a car how much will you pay me to watch your ad you dox right? yourself <laughs> you, you, yeah but you could create it you can create a, a wallet or a, a specific key Mm. just to do that and then if you want to purchase the car you get your discount using that key so you sign the transaction with that key in the end but you could probably get forty dollars from a car manufacturer to you know fifty dollars to watch their ad if they knew you said you were interested in buying a car mm. um and that might be enough to pay for you, you and your family's browsing for a week um without any other ads because the ad store would be a thing that interacts with your browsing surface um, you know, dedicated wallet, you have to do that, that only injects ads, as we were saying before, when you actually need to see one because you're low on cash. So it might so come up once, people once are a month. Screwed and rich car buyers get free internet. This is oh, the this is the car example. Um, so I think this, there's a bunch of things like that where they turn around when the, when the incentives can be layered into other incentives. Uh, things like your ISP giving you free service in exchange for being the recipient of the first hop of all your side of transactions. Like that's a very different model to now, but it actually makes way more sense than paying your ISP and then giving all your data to some third party to just monetize, you know, as they see fit. Um, 
Progress on hiring? Should we? Well, I think we do that. Let's tackle privacy. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I can tackle this. First of all, it's just like Bitcoin. So start with Bitcoin. That's what you've got. You want multiple wallets. You want deterministic mm -hmm. key generation. That's fine. Go with it. Um, we're not starting with this because why would we start with this? But, you, you know, that's the that's the roadmap. There is a loss in privacy and anonymity in one way. Maybe. Uh, that's because we are doing routing SIGs. So if you, you, you're paying with this fee and it's going to get this routing path. So people will be able for most, one, they're going to know you signed it. That's just Bitcoin. But for most things, people will be able to track where it came from. So if you are uh, publishing child porn onto the network, you're going to have a problem because uh, people can kind of backtrace and figure out, well, maybe this was the entry server. Well, let's subpoena them. So good news is if there's something that the entire world can agree is bad, the network can probably deal with that. If there's something where 50% of the world doesn't agree on it, though, it doesn't matter. You know, if the U.S. isn't protecting your free speech and you want to make a comment, well, send it through Saudi Arabia. That's fine. Or vice versa. Um, with that said, you can also do things like encrypted transactions, send encrypted transactions within transactions. And you could also have side deals with these edge nodes on the network where they will put your transaction in a block, even though it doesn't have any cryptographic routing. And so they can't collect a fee from it. So there are kind of there's side models to work around that. For me, the most interesting thing in terms of what's new to Sato is the idea that we like the routing paths that are used to produce blocks and handle payment. I guess they do leak some information. Um, and so if you want to deal with that, you're going to have to work around that economically by paying in some other way or, you know, having a fatter transaction because you're using some method like a transaction in a transaction to get anonymity. Richard, you have any any specific thoughts like IP addresses? It's not. Yeah, like it's. I think key. there's. I mean, there's some very simple things people could do to create Tor-like scenarios in terms of needing m money to pay, which mm -hmm. is the only reason. The only res like the, the logic I'm going through there is the only reason not to send every every message from a new key if you're after anonymity is you've got to fund it to do that. But it would be very, very simple to create a pool of funds that mm -hmm. people could use to pay for their transactions, where there was a dis just a disconnect, right? So um, you could do a tour like system where essentially people were paying for a pool of transactions and they don't, you know, what yeah. comes in and out is, is anonymized because you can just create the keys. So yeah. I think there's there's a lot of options there. The thing to me um that i like about where we are with Sido with this and it's what we've been trying to make sure we kind of maintain is that you give people the cryptographic tools and you push things like moderation and enforcement etc to um be up to be opt-in or to be um you know to require old-fashioned like agreement if, if everybody says you know that they, they want to exclude a server but it has to be everybody basically yeah um but you give people powerful tools like opt-in moderation you can set up a club so you can have a global unfettered twitter like application but you can set up a group if it's a value to you to make it kids safe to your definition so a group of people can fund that or crowdsource it and say okay yeah. we will all give our kids an app where the tweets have to be approved or they're moderated in a certain way um and we'll we'll pay for that we'll support that in some way if you want to but you but th yeah. there's a disconnect between the the in that case the censoring group which is the parents yeah. or whatever involved and the substrate there's no ownership Yep. in the sensor side of the substrate so it's like the app store the reviewers can be separate from the publishers because it's right. no um yeah. the only maybe thing i'll add is there are some situations you might want to there's no ip addresses exposed it's just public key stuff like yeah. the nodes know the ip addresses of the nodes they're connecting to no one else does yeah. um well and there's there'd be no, no problem going through tor or whatever like yeah, yeah. It's not going to rely on your IP address, so it doesn't know. Yeah. I might want to put my name in a new GB, uh, GB uh, and a new, you know, at a private, at a public key or something online, um, for various reasons. It's a good idea that you could do that to prove, like, the earliest broadcast of that is 
clearly the legitimate one. Yeah. Um, because if you're being attacked, well, you're being attacked after you've provided that information. Um, you want to get down to energy consumption, maybe? I kind of uh, like going through yeah. them. Yeah, I think um, I'll just, um, upper top is is budget. Did we want to do, oh, they've, they've slipped, slipped order for me. Uh, yeah, let's do energy consumption, then budget, and keep going down. Okay, uh, so <coughs> the idea is, um, one, we're not spending 100% of our budget hashing. We're spending 50% in classic Sato. In production, it's 25%. The beautiful thing is that as what the staking table does is it eats up money too. So even though we're only spending a quarter of the money on hashing, we're still getting 100% plus cost of attack. So from a green perspective, well, that's a lot greener than proof of work. Uh, we can reduce it further. Uh, we reduce it further by saying instead of one golden ticket every two blocks on average, we want one every three blocks on average, one every four blocks on average. The trade-off if we do this is that it gets cheaper to reorg the tip of the chain. So, you know, we're going to go with this and we're going to see what it's like um, before we make that decision. But if we can get high cost of attack uh, through transaction volume, we can do that and we can reduce hashing further. Well, keeping cost of attack well over yeah. 100%. Yeah. Um, I think the, the thing to me there is we have the original uh, implementation of Sido had a, a floating pay split, which was voted on by different entities. Yeah. And that was removed purely because we realized you can't really have voting in an uninformed public. It, and that's what we'd start with. Without yeah. boundary functionality. We, yeah. yeah, and Richard's right. So, we can reduce the percentage of the fees that go to miners to that yeah. low maturity is all. If you think about if you think about the amount of mining that you need for it to be of any kind of environmental concern, i.e., when it's going past people using idle uh, processor cycles to do it, then it's quite clear that you know if you compare that to the amount of what that value will get out of out of routing, it's quite clear that you you know you at any volume at any real volume of traffic the network would be able to agree a fork to shift that down and maybe also move to voting if mm -hmm. if dynamic pay split became desirable at some point in the yeah. future when people understood you know when when all the players in this is uh in the voting yeah. groups had enough information to actually act rationally um and so that would mean i think you'd see a drive down on on the hashing function to being the bare minimum because nobody wants it except for the mm -hmm. fact that they need to rely on the golden tickets being accurate. It's, it's, it's literally cost of attack. Um, the question mm -hmm. about is it susceptible to mining bans? It's like, who cares? Like, we're not using mining to produce the longest blockchain. We're using mm -hmm. mining to unlock the money. So it's not like China now owns the ability to control the longest chain if they're the only ones hashing. It's China now owns the ability to kind of release a payment for the network. Um, but they don't control who gets paid. They get paid their 25% for mining. They're not leveraging mining to attack the blockchain. So like, even if mining is banned in a lot of places, it doesn't hurt us the way it hurts proof of work, where like, you know, mining is literally who controls the blockchain. Uh, but yeah, I, there, there are things we can do. I think we're not focused on them now. When cost of attack is really quite high, we'll be able to lower this if we want. And I think long term we do want to lower it, but that's why we also, I think cost of attack now is 25%, 120, 125 to 150. And I think we've got a roadmap to get it over 200%. Um, we'll see. Yep. Cool. Uh, I might step into just the budget question there. And I think uh, as much to not avoid it, I don't think there's too much to be said that isn't public already, but just to be not avoiding the question. Um, we have more money now than we did uh, at IDO, or just post IDO uh, through decent management, et cetera. And we haven't been selling any foundation tokens or anything. So we haven't made any moves like that. Um, we are cautious about spending money we don't just throw it around at things we don't know, need to be valuable but honestly if we look at team size uh, a frank uh evaluation from my seat is that we've been as as circumspect about growing the team because of our ability to do it well and to find the right people and to 
you know, to handle that change as as it has been um, about the, the budget. And I think maybe that the, those two are related. I've seen blockchain projects fill a room with 35 developers because that's sort of the done thing to do. Um, but I don't know that we would have had profitable results from doing that. We wouldn't um, have. We, we, I know we wouldn't have. No. Um, it would certainly have been a waste. And I think people can see the way we run the, the project and the way we're trying to push ahead. It's not a matter of, um, you know, just build some, you know, nobody's getting prizes for having a number of devs at desk. We're, we're, we're more you know, concerned about that whole holistic roadmap and getting that to push ahead. And some of that depends on getting the word out realistically, getting people to understand. It's similar to early days Bitcoin where the issue wasn't, you know, like can, can someone pay for devs or something? It was, do we have a community that, that can under, you know, understand and bring the project forward? Um, and so it's it's a mix of those things. The budget is is secure, and you know, as I said, we haven't made moves on uh, any of the treasury tokens as yet. We do have plans for foundation funding and so forth to come out of those tokens, but they're at points and in, in, in the future when it makes more sense for the project. We're not going to be pushing more tokens into the market for any you know for the foreseeable future for any anything like the kind of price ranges etc. that we are now. Um, so it's it's a combination of factors there, but the budget is solid, um, and you know supports a roadmap of, of five to ten years, uh, you know currently, and um, you know we will grow and expand as that as that increases. Don't know if David, you had any other things. Yeah, you to I, I kind of think of it as um, we're doing well. We're not squandering funds. Like at the IDO, we we had three years of funding. We now have more than three years of funding. Um, we want to be growing and increasing our our uh, increasing what we're burning and and the devs that we're hiring. We're mm -hmm. doing it as fast as we can. Yeah, and I, you know, like I don't think people need to worry about the financial roadmap. Like we're releasing software, Sato is getting better and better, and yeah. as Sato gets better and better, like you know, one way to think of it is we deliberately didn't do something like the Ethereum or the EOS public sale because it's pointless to do fundraising in an environment where people don't understand you. So, you know, fun, or, you know, our fundraising long-term goals for the project involve the network doing very, very well and people realizing that they really need and want to get involved. And we've got the money and the roadmap to execute that. So, yep. you know. Cool. You want me to take the censorship one? Because I think there are two questions. I think there are two answers here. Yeah. The first is, look, if you've got someone who can literally take down the internet, yeah, they can reduce access to your blockchain. Right. If you've got someone who can sever the trans-Pacific uh, internet cables, yeah, it's kind of tough to have a trans-Pacific blockchain. Um, here's the more important thing, I think, though. If you've got, let's say, China and North Korea as a hypothetical example, and the guys in North Korea, they don't want you to have access to this wonderful global blockchain for reasons. If anybody, if anyone can get around that, there is an economic incentive in Sado to do it. Because anybody, you got to sign the transaction to them, and then they get it to the network. They make money. So I can't say that, like, you know, every, are there ways to mitigate censorship? Well, Sato's answer is incentivize inherent, incentivize access. Like, sure, maybe the fee, the transaction pay, fee I need to pay in North Korea is really, really high because there's only two guys that are running transactions but they get paid out of that transaction fee. So that's an incentive. Um, in terms of mitigating censorship, the other big difference is cost of attack is over 100%. So if, uh, if a nation state, as long as people will continue making transactions and force the nation state to continue to make blocks, you can bankrupt anyone. It's just gonna take a long time if it's a really, really, really rich uh, organization and you've got a small network. So that's why part of the goal is we build a really big network. So the cost of attack is just appalling. Yeah. Uh, particularly is, if particularly if people want to act against it, right? So that yeah. people can actually see it happening in real time and, and yeah. act in a way that makes it even more expensive. Pay, pay higher fees and you force them to bleed out faster. And like, you know, you can see it also in a change in the way that people orient themselves towards the chain, right? Like, all of this, oh, they're forking the chain to attack us stuff is because, why is that? Well, one reason is if you fork the chain, you're now collecting all of the profits on that chain if you're the attacker. Well, with Sato, if you do that, 
well, I've got some honest blocks here. If you're including my transactions, I don't care. I'm still paid. Okay, you're censoring the network at a loss, but you're literally transferring me money. I'm going to stick around. My users' transactions are going on. Maybe I don't like you, but I know you're bleeding out. It doesn't bother me that much. I don't care about defending this fork. I'm going to continue building off of whatever blockchain you are producing. And that's the that's one of the incentive uh, changes that, that gets fixed when you solve the 51% attack. It's the fact that there's no economically profitable, like you don't have the honest network and the attackers arguing over who gets all of the money from this point. Either the attackers are paying the honest nodes on their censored chain, or they're not. And if they're not, the honest network's just waiting, waiting for the opportunity to keep going. And in fact, they want to build off this because this is the most secure point to build from. So, yeah, uh, you know, if someone wants to cut Pacific fiber cables, we're vulnerable to that, but so is everyone. Uh, and otherwise, we've got a better incentive structure. And I think the incentives also encourage people to be dealing with attacks in a way that um, makes us more resilient. But we're going to find that out in practice, right? Cool. I think we've just kicked over the hour. So maybe a couple of like one or two word answers to mm -hmm. some of the following questions and then we can wrap it up. Um, I think on sharding and braided chains, my really quick answer is the one that we gave earlier, which was you lose universal broadcast. Aside from kind of mostly being about kicking the scaling issues that they want to resolve, just kicking those down the road rather than solving them they they cause real problems with uh cross shard communication etc where it it's either technically vulnerable or you're adding some level of trust to the party in there to, to to manage like contacting other people on the network and that's something that i think you know for very obvious reasons we avoid i think sharding's fine they push the problems out of the model and then they pretend they don't exist and they're like look it's a wonderful solution it's like no it's not you know, it's not a bad solution if that's what you want. Um, I think if you people, you know, if people really decide they want sharding, do it on Sato. Take a Sato approach to it. Build a proper yeah. shard blockchain on something that doesn't have these massive yeah. holes. Yeah, uh, third-party crypto using third-party cryptos in the yes. arcade. Uh, short exactly. Yeah, short answer is yes. <laughs> um, uh, listed on. Yeah, listed on CEXs. We are on gate.io and about seven other exchanges, um, you know, larger ones to come uh, as they you know, work things out. Um, Dedicated head of marketing, we have one. Yeah. <coughs> They're doing work. It's just not visible, I think, because it a lot of it involves dealing with uh, supporters, seed round, that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's happening. You I, know, I think... That a lot of the stuff I introduced at the start about the AMAs and uh, supporter articles going out, the videos mm -hmm. that are happening, that's that's coming through that role. The, um, it's, the focus is going to change as all of the vesting is done. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it will be more clear what Shirley's doing and the value yeah. she's contributing. Yeah, and I think it's also one of those things where we're not, we're not taking out ads on the side of buses or like doing some really arbitrary shit coining stuff that people sometimes expect my that favorite doesn't mean, that doesn't mean we don't do marketing. <laughs> my favorite is when Shirley sets something up. We do it. We get a bunch of new users who come in and ask us when marketing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, okay, yeah, we're starting we, to... maybe with marketing, the answer maybe people are asking when are we going to ramp up marketing? And I think the answer to that is we want to see how the arcade, the generic Web three crypto stuff works. Um, I think we're still feeling on the arcade side. I think we're still feeling towards what are the problems that are prevent, preventing people from using us? Like one big question I have is you can see we made changes to the forum because we used to have the front page. It was like, test, test, hello, friends, test. You know, you visit the site, you know, this is not a forum you want to use. We've changed that. We're experimenting with it. We haven't figured it out yet, though. Like our team doesn't like using that forum. There's something wrong. We got to fix that. Um, when we fix that and we have this organic growth as our community and we've solved these problems, that's when we want to bring on marketing so that people come to this dynamic, exciting environment and they're like, oh my God, this is wonderful. Uh, like before that, as long as we're making progress and working on it, why, why take yeah. a shot? Well, like, I think it's, it, it's a similar thing as the when Binance, well, okay, we could give them literally a million dollars at any time. Um, yeah, we could. And then we're dumping a million dollars worth of liquidity on everybody who's involved. Like we might get a bump, 
but you know, I don't think realistically, especially when you look at the revalued tokens at the end, wh whether yep. that really helps anyone. So it's it's about making sure holistically things work. We could do short term marketing, which gets some people to come in. You, know, you can do things like airdrops to juice the number of holders. The marketing I think is working is there's more and more people pushing the core ideas out there and people are feeling mm -hmm. they need to have an opinion on it. And I think it's more and more clear to everyone in the community that nobody has an answer to our critique. Uh, yeah. And I'm hoping that that will continue to accelerate because that's far more, that's the most powerful form of marketing. Um, um, fun, funnily, one of the things that you see happening out of that is that, that um, our own supporters, Seed Round and, and so forth, you know, take us more and more seriously because of that. Different people in industry do the same thing. And that's actually having a big, a big impact on, on the weight we carry. Um, mm. Uh, and that that to me is, is actually something that's really important to like you know mm. moving forward as a you know top tier crypto um cool let's, you you want to really 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 quickly do anything uh integration with Polka, like kusama polka dot the what's happening there is the old code we're literally running polka dot servers and kusama servers they keep going down they keep upgrading it it's a nightmare we're having to upgrade this and the push kick of the push is that we're not getting any marketing or promotional assistance from polka dot uh, and one of the reasons for this is that they're a dev heavy project and they're doing this and then they're doing that and things get pushed back so we're changing the way we're doing things uh, dot will be back on the arcade when web3 crypto uh, is released it's a lot less less dev effort for us um, and yeah we'll be doing reach out for them that uh, better support from us as kind well. of <laughs> into, you know yeah. like we add dot to the chain and marketing Yep. is helping us to reach out we had elrond and people are helping reach out or nano or we yep. can do it community by community but ideally we do it community by community where we've got this application set where like people want to use the forum we fix those issues yep. cool um i think it's probably good to wrap things up there and maybe call this a night um i usually tend to head over to telegram and spend a bit of time in the in the major telegram group uh, at side oio uh, and we can wrap up and answer any other kind of outstanding questions there for for a little while uh thanks everyone for coming uh, it's okay. always a pleasure really enjoy it great thank you guys See everyone